Hey, this is Jay. And this is Chelsea. Welcome to the Shifting Perceptions Podcast. We are bringing you inspiration to live a more creative lifestyle because our favorite people are the ones that choose the path less traveled. Hey guys, this is Jay and I have a great conversation to share with you. I spoke to my friend Daniel Paisner, who is an author. He's most well-known as being a ghostwriter for such people as Ray Lewis, Denzel Washington, Steve Aoki, Whoopi Goldberg, Ivanka Trump, Anthony Quinn, John Kasich, tennis champion Serena Williams, and one of my favorites, the one and only Damon John of FUBU fame and Shark Tank, which I've watched every single episode. Dan and I chatted about his beginnings as a student in New York schools and being a class clown and how that morphed into becoming known for his writing and recognized for his ability to kind of translate stories and becoming a ghostwriter and just it kind of goes on and on from there and really cool tangents. Dan and I connected originally through a mutual friend, which you'll hear about in the surf world. And I really can't emphasize this enough. Whether you're an avid reader or aspiring author or none of the above, there are so many good bits of insight and experience in here. Dan has not only such a rich and incredible career that he shares with us and his own insight, but the fact that he spent so many decades with some of the most influential and talented people in the world becoming their voice, he has absorbed a lot of that and found ways to articulate the commonalities between them, and I really found that to be extremely interesting. Uh, before we get on to it, I would like to ask that you guys check out Dan on Twitter. He's pretty active, at Daniel Paisner. His last name is spelled P-A-I-S-N-E-R. You could also check him out at DanielPaisner.com. I am on all social medias, at J Alders. My website is jalders.com. That's A-L-D-E-R-S.com. You could also find show notes and links to all the episodes. And um, that's about it, guys. I hope you love it. Let's get to the conversation I had with Daniel Paisner. Well, hey, Dan. I'm really excited to talk to you today. We chatted once before over the summer, and or actually <laughs> not over the summer, over the spring, I guess it was, and um, really enjoyed it. And I'm looking forward to kind of diving in deeper. I feel like you're a very uh, fascinating and kind person, and uh, I feel like you're you're the kind of guy, from what I gather so far, that you'd be willing to share some gems from your insane experience and uh, as a writer, as well as a dad. So I'm excited to chat with you. So thank you, Dan. Well, thanks for having me, Jay. I, I mean, I think you probably feel these things because we haven't really met yet. So as we be. chat, I will, I will dissuade you from these notions. I also know <laughs> you, have a, um, you have a ski house, so I'm kind of trying to like, schmooze you so I can get a guest room. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, see how it, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Fair enough. By the way, speaking of your artwork, so I went I went onto your uh, website the other day, uh, looking to see if you had any snowboard art, and I found one piece. I showed it to my wife. I said, "Would would you hang this in our house? You know, out in Utah?" She goes, "Oh fuck yeah, totally would." You can't you can't beat a reaction like that, man. You know, wife the f bombs. I like her already. I was on your site as well. We did a, sw- a site swap. I was scoping you out. You like, Jesus Christ, you've done a lot of stuff, man. <laughs> I have. It's enough. It's enough already. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, before we uh, get going, like, do you prefer Dan or Daniel when I'm talking to you in a conversational method? Uh, I mean, Dan, Dan is always more relaxed and easy. Okay. You can introduce me as Daniel, but you can call me Dan. That's yeah. Fine. I'll do the fancy the fancy intro post uh, post recording. I'll do a fancier intro. I like keeping it just okay. conversational. So I just didn't know in conversation if you're like. Call me Daniel, you bastard. Uh, any, you can call me anything you want. I've got kids, I, people I grew up with that I still talk to who call me Danny. Yeah. So I answer to anything. You know, well, my wife calls me Danny sometimes. So. Well, you live in it Long Island, it. right? So you're, uh, you've been called worse, I'm sure, in your life. <laughs> well, one thing I don't know about, I did a little snooping around, like just trying to learn a bit, of, a bit about you. But um, I don't know much about your family life. And I'm really curious. I'm always, always curious, just being uh, an artist myself, where this all came from. Um, I would love to know what like childhood Danny was like, you know, can you tell me about 
um, like your childhood? Were your parents creative? Like where all this sort of manifested and how it came about? Can you, can you dive in on that? Sure. My, my parents were creative, but only in the sense of being abundantly clever. Um, you know, my, my father I, was creative in his professional life. He, um, uh, he made um, a, a line of novelty braids and, and fabrics and textile trims. And I'm sure there was creativity involved in what he was doing. My, but I, I, would, I would guess the direct through line to what I do now probably came from my mother. She was a school teacher before she started having kids. And she was a passionate reader and instilled in her children from a very early age a, a love of books. In fact, I still have uh, the books she used to give us when um, whenever it was her birthday, we got birthday presents and they were always, you know, age appropriate books that she'd inscribe um, uh, to us. And and so I've read for my whole life and I found early on that I um, maybe I was just full of shit and I had a, a pension for just making things up. But I was a good storyteller and I had a facility uh, with words and, and writing came easily to me. And I was encouraged in that, you know, going all the way back to um, uh, to grade school. I remember, you know, probably in kindergarten or second grade, putting together like a community newspaper with a buddy of mine whose mom was a librarian and she'd run it off for us on mimeograph paper and we'd slip it yeah. under people's doors. Um, so this was just something that was always in the air and, and all around. What did she teach? What did your mom teach? She was a kindergarten teacher. Um, so it was it was you know, really a bare bones early on, early child development stuff. But I think she knew how to push the right buttons uh, in little kids and to get them uh, to ignite their imaginations in some way. But you remember like distinctly as a kid, like like doing doing writing, was it so for me is in my experience from from doing my art, art was very much like a coping mechanism as well as sort of an escape. Was that was there a parallel with you? Were you like trying to tune in to what was going on in your mind? Were you trying to escape from what was going on? Is it none of the above? Like where, where did that fit in for you? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's none of the above. I mean, there, I, I had a, a pretty sweet childhood, so there was nothing really to escape from, okay. but I did enjoy creating stuff and building stuff and putting something into the world that wasn't there before. So I used to write stories. I had a friend who was a talented musician. We used to write songs together. You know, we were, 12, 13, 14 years old. And um, so th there, there was always that juice flowing. Um, and, and one of my very favorite things then and now was to uh, sort of jump down that rabbit hole and look up and wonder where the hell the time goes. Yeah. You know, when you're in the zone and when you're feeling it, uh, the time just kind of melts away um, and you you find your way through whatever whatever it is you're writing or creating. Uh, and you look up at the other side and, and the day has gone. And I think that's kind of great. But no, I wasn't yeah. trying to escape anything. I was, it was really more of a muscle that I enjoyed exercising. How do you think it validated you? Like what, what, what was it? Was it, were you getting attention from your parents? Was it like something that you liked the outcome? Was it more about the process? Like you mentioned the kind of like implied about like the state of flow that we all can relate to, like getting in the zone and time sort of melts away. Like that's obviously a very euphoric amazing reason by itself but was there validation that kept you going that also acted as like a you know a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow for you what was it that choose to you probably the early validation was in making other people laugh you know i wasn't that interested in in having my little buddies or even my parents or teachers for that matter admire the craft so much as um you know the stoke of trying to pull a reaction from somebody was just great. And, and when you're a kid, that reaction for me, the important currency was laughter. So if I can get somebody to crack up, you know, to laugh so hard that milk came out their nose, <laughs> yes. that to me was a four star review. Yeah. And, you know, I, I had a, a good group of pals. And as we got into high school, we, um, I, I was able to commandeer the high school newspaper. I was the editor of the paper and I was able to sort of, you know, bend it to my will and, and insert all kinds of funny, weird things that just kind of amused me. And maybe they gently amused my friends and other people 
thought I was just weird. I have a very, very specific memory of, and this is later, so it's not quite formative, but I was probably 16 or 17 years old at this point. Yeah. And back in the old days, we used to have to physically lay out these newspapers. Now, now you could do it online, but we would cut and paste and see what fit. And it was like working a puzzle. And we had on the front page of our paper, one issue, we had this little tiny one column square, one, one column inch hole that I couldn't quite fill. So I figured, you know, I'll just write a little poem and stick it on the front page. And, and the poem, I still remember the poem. It was, it was called summer song. And the line of the poem was, uh, the one line of the poem was purple is my favorite color said the frog with no legs who cared said the dirt so it was it was like nonsense <laughs> maybe i was reading ogden nash maybe i was okay. you know maybe i'd gotten stoned the day before who the hell knows yeah and i i remember the specific memory is going into an english classroom later in the day after the issue came out and seeing the poem written out by the teacher on the blackboard in front of the class because he was trying to parse what I had written and get his students in the class, in the section of the class before mine to figure out what that might've meant, because surely it must be profound. <laughs> but all it was, it was about a frog with no legs yeah. talking to the dirt. Right. You know? <laughs> Which, how, well, so that, that amused, that amused me. <laughs> that reminds me of like a funny story from college. I was in, I had this, this sculpture teacher that was like super far out there. And, uh, I like was I was probably hung over and we had a project due and it was like a sculpture thing like I'll create something with social meeting blah 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 and I like literally was I woke up late I was hung over I took my garbage can in my dorm room emptied it out duct taped it together put it on a pedestal and then proceeded to watch the entire class critique it for 20 minutes finding the meaning and Beautiful. it, it kind of okay. reminds me right. of that right, right. It's, just, it's just absurd <laughs> and um, I, I just thought that was kind of great and I'm sure you thought your experience was kind of great yeah it, it does just point to the absurdity of like what we do like art and, and writing like th there's there's certainly a craft and a mastery to it but then there's also the side of it of like in in some regards almost anything can pass as like art and air quotes you know it's it's right. it's kind of funny how would your high school kids how would your high school buddies um have described you would you were you like the class clown was this like more in your group or were you like were you was this known that that Dan is Danny is like this crazy clowny guy that makes funny jokes like I was pretty much a class clown and a cut up um but for some reason I had the reputation of of being a good writer and I think that was because you know it, it kind of came easily to me as as people were pulling their hair out you know if, if we had a 5 or 6 or 10 page assignment people would stress on that and I'd sit down and and kind of knock it out um and it was no big deal so if I had any rep at all, it was that this came easily to me, yeah. I think. Um, uh, but I did have, I did have a, a certain reputation um, uh, as, as a writer of some kind. Whether it was earned or not, I don't know. But, <laughs> right. I, but I wore it proudly. And what, ta what town was this that you grew up in? I grew up on Long Island in uh, the old Westbury School District. The Wheatley School, which Westbury, was a public yeah. school with the pretentious name. How close is that to the beach? West, I don't know Westbury that much. Uh, it's not far. It's uh, as the crow flies. It's probably eight or nine miles to Jones Beach. Was that a big part of your life, like the Jones Beach culture and the beach culture and the concerts and all that? Was that if they weren't doing the Jones Beach concerts then? I don't think that theater was there when I was a kid. So that part is is a new, relatively new development. Um, the beach was not as much of a part of my childhood as as perhaps it. It should have been. Mm. Um, you needed a car. It wasn't easy to get to by right. public transportation. So it really didn't become part of our routines and, until we had wheels. That's so literally we the same. A little older. It's literally the same as me. I, I grew up probably about like twelve miles from the beach, but until I had a car, it might have been. It might as well have been a hundred miles away. You know, without right without your own means of getting there. I'm, I'm interested. Where were like, you? Oh, Were you grew, on Long Island too? No, I'm a Jersey guy. So I grew up in like Monmouth County. I don't know if you know Jersey right. at all. Jersey, Jersey Shore. You know? Yep. Um, yep. So I grew up in Howell. It's like straight off 195. Uh, easy straight drive. But my parents weren't about just driving me there just for the sake of it. So, you know, once I got my car, then it was like game on. But until then, it was just, here's your blood. Here's your street. Stay outside and have fun. Right. Right. I mean, I was... Uh, my my group of friends we were also big skiers which was hard to do when you're stuck on long island 
Uh, there was a there was a little tiny hill with a rope tow that had an elevation of about twelve feet, uh, <laughs> called, and I think it was called Bald Hill. It was a conveniently named ball. Bald Hill. Um, but in order to really ski, you had to drive, you know, to Jersey, to Vernon Valley in those yeah, days yep. or go up to Hunter Mountain. But it was sometimes easier. In some ways, it was easier to get um, to a uh, a mountain to ski than it was to get to the ocean because they had all these tours. There yeah. were these organizations like Peak Ski Tours and you'd hop on a bus and and they would take you and drop you off. And, um, and those. so we were starting to do that by the time we were you know, 13 years old, we were autonomous enough to do that. Yeah. And it was easier to do that than to go to the beach. Same here. Yeah. I took a lot of those tours when I was like a teenager. It was like, it was much more accessible being in like in Jersey, just take the, we used to go to the same spots, Hunter and Vernon, great, you know, great spots right. to learn on, you know, it was really fun. Right. Vernon, Vernon Valley, Vernon Valley was right next to a great gorge, which was a playboy resort. That's right. So there was right a down playboy the hotel at the base, right? right down the street. I was off 90, uh, 94 is the road, I think. But yeah, right down. That's no like, idea. that's like a, uh, fancy, fancy schmancy, like timeshare resort type place with a golf course now. Right. Okay. I'm curious. So goes the world. I'm, I'm super curious. Like cause you're, you're very personable. You're clearly funny and you know how to write. Like you have all the ingredients. And, and from what I read in your bio, you're very tall. So you have a lot of the ingredients <laughs> of like a, uh, you could have, you could have like, you know, done, been in, on a microphone and doing stand up comedy or doing something where you're an actor. Like, it seems like you're very outgoing and you have a lot of the skills and, and charisma. Was that ever a, a thing for you? Like, were you ever a, either theatrical or have those kind of aspirations at all? You know, I, I never did. I, um, uh, I just never leaned that way. I started doing this as, at a fairly early age. And we should tell your listeners before we go uh, too deep into this conversation that. The bulk of my writing, my principal living, comes from uh, uh, writing of a very different sort, and certainly not the kind I imagined when I was a kid. So it's it's not the career I envisioned in in any way. It's been a great ride, sure, and um, I'm I'm good at what I do and I enjoy what I do, but um, I'm primarily a, a ghostwriter. I help other people write. So as clever as I thought I was when I was eight and ten and twelve years old, and as much as I amused myself. It turns out, alas, I wasn't amusing too many other people <laughs> who were actually going to pay to read my work. So I couldn't support myself doing that. And I discovered at a fairly early age, the first book uh, I did in this genre for somebody else, I was 26 years old. Wow. Um, and really... I, never thought, I never thought I would do that forever. But you know what? It, it was fun. It was different. It was outside the box a little bit, and it went well enough that I got invited back to another gig, and then another one after that. And one day I looked up, and I'm a six year old guy losing his hair, and uh, and still cranking out these books. Let's so let's let's go there. So I know you did some journalism as well. Like you've done different kinds of writing. You've done some fiction. You've done some nonfiction. You've done lots of different yes. things. Cause, so what does it feel like as as a writer? Obviously with talent and experience. What is it like having the experience of being like now you're getting a lot of recognition so people know who you are now but i'm assuming at the beginning when you're a ghostwriter it's like literally like you're like a ghost no one necessarily knows who you are is what is that like uh does it affect your ego is there any of that in it or is it just like i'm i'm excited i'm stoked to get a job and, and get paid i don't even think about that like what is that like being just like a work for hire in the background not getting credit at the beginning you know i think you have to separate ego out of the equation i, I don't i don't think you can do this kind of work and um, and and be concerned with credit or recognition in, in any form other than credit enough and recognition enough to get your next gig. But, you know, if, you, if you're looking to walk past a bookstore and see your name in the window in, in a big display by the cash register, this is not the slice of publishing for you. Um, so what I've tried to do, I, I continue to write books of my own. I've published um, uh, three novels of my own. I just finished my fourth, that was my big pandemic project. Okay. And they get published, but you know, not a whole lot of people read them. I could not send my kids to college or, or put um, um, braces on their teeth if I had to survive off of what I make from, from my novels. So what I learned to do early on is, is to separate the kind of writing I do for myself from the kind of writing I do for others. And, I've and I started to think of the ghostwriting piece as more of a craft than an art. This, the similarity, I guess, in your world would be 
you know, somebody in your position who might be hired from time to time to do a portrait for mm-hmm. hire or a commission piece that was merely more, um, you know, a decoration for a room than it was a work of art that that you were proud of. But it paid the bill and bills and you enjoyed doing it. So that's kind of where I found myself. And the bargain I made early on with the very first book I did is I said, look, I'll do one of theirs and I'll do one of mine. Right. So, it, uh, it, so in a lot of ways, I was the same way you see that cliche with the actors who wait tables between gigs. I, I was waiting tables between gigs, except I was able to do that as a writer, but as a writer of a different stripe. Yeah, there's, I definitely have that as well. Like I do a lot of um, commission and freelance stuff. I think I'm I'm fortunate in that most of my freelance and commission stuff nowadays, it's like people want me for my style, but they want to sort of be in the pilot seat of like where my style takes their project or their vision. So I'm like really fortunate in that regard that I'm not just, although I did many, many, many years where it was like, hey, can you draw or paint this you know, picture of our baby with a flower or whatever? I did plenty of that stuff too. So there's, it's definitely an aspect of like, you know, you have to be lucky and grateful and fortunate and all that stuff when you just get the work like period that's uh and how do you feel how do you feel about that stuff now like if somebody came to you with um and dangled the prospect in front of you and said hey take yourself out of this do what i want but i'm going to give you a shit ton of money do you jump that or do you say no i'm I'm past that now um at this point with with three young children it depends on if it was a shit ton of money i'll i'll you know i'll do a portrait of their of their poop with flies going around it like yeah but um i don't (laughs) generally get asked that stuff when i do it's not generally a shit ton of money usually like the better money or the better opportunities in my career generally are 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 selected for things that are that have to do with what i'm doing but i i definitely did that a lot um that's a tough one like you said when you have that like you know, that carrot dangling in front of you, like, Hey Dan, here's lots and lots of money to write a book. Like I a hundred percent get that. And I would, I would do the same thing. I just, I was curious about the ego aspect. Um, cause I feel like a lot as artists, a lot of artists that I know, including myself, there is some sub subconscious level of like, I want to be, get validation for what I did because it is a lot of work. So I was super curious right. on that, but well, it's, you know, it's a lot of work, but I, it, it's something other than, I mean, there's creativity involved. Yes, totally. Don't get me wrong. And I don't mean, to, I don't mean to undermine or undersell what I do, yeah. but it, it's, it really is creativity of a different kind. And, and it really is more craft than art. So, yeah. you know, when you think about it, if I'm helping to write somebody else's life story, those books live or die a on their ability to tell that story well, because I can't tell it well on their behalf if they can't tell it well to me, but also B, it lives and dies on the size of their celebrity. So if the book doesn't sell, it's more likely because their platform, their reach, their brand is not what they or the publisher had thought it was. And the book just didn't connect with audiences in a meaningful way, not because of anything I did or didn't do. And by the same token, if the book is a smashing success, most likely it is a smashing success because of the size of of their platform. Yeah, that has a lot to do with it. I'm curious of your your process. Does your process differ greatly when it's like your own novel where there's not necessarily the same kind of pressures and deadlines or outside influence? Is that do you find like your inspiration and creative process and your focus and all of that and your ideas like do they flow in and flow out the same or a different way when it's your own work versus let's say doing a book for Damon John for instance? When it's my own, um, I, I need to have a clear head when I'm working on something of my own. When I'm working on something for somebody else, my head needs to be filled with the stuff of their lives and all the notes I have in front of me and whatever it is our agenda is for those next 10 or 20 or 30 pages. When it's a book of my own, the page is blank. Yeah. And I need to, sh- I need to dial down the world. I think I work best very early in the morning before when my kids were little, it had to be before my household woke up mm-hmm. um, or sometimes very late at night when the house was asleep. Yeah. Um, now I'm finding I sometimes uh, work best if I remove myself physically from my primary residence and my primary workspace uh, and go someplace else like a, a ski house yeah. and kind of hole up there and create my own writer's retreat. So I, I kind of need a different environment to um uh to exercise 
th those muscles in that way. It, se it seems like a different process for me. I don't know how it is for other writers. I don't know how it is for you if it's a commissioned piece of work where you're not waiting for a light bulb over your own head or for inspiration to hit. It's probably similar. I think for me, if it's my, my own piece, it's, it feels like there's like a pilot light inside of me that's lit and I'm just, I'm like, I'm, I'm raring to go and I, I'm looking for solutions and, and it's, I'm, I'm charged. And when it's freelance for me, it's like, um, that, that's not necessarily the case. It's more like I have to find my way to be inspired by whatever it may be, even if I'm not at first, you have to create the, you have to light your own pilot light at that point and you have to kind of mine for it and dig and hammer away. It's probably very similar. I was, I was super curious about that. Do you have a, um, can you flip, can you flip that on and off though? Like, do you start a day saying today I'm working on my stuff or today I'm working on their stuff or, and what happens if it's a day you're supposed to work on your stuff and it's just not coming? Do you, yeah. know, do you switch gears or, or do you just go fishing? <laughs> well, I don't fish. That probably saves that problem. But occur, I mean, today, for instance, I'm, I'm working on two pieces that are both due within a matter of a week or two. And they're both freelance. One's a commission and one's a freelance for a band. And neither one are like my idea so much. So it's like I have to f dive in and figure it out. But I think the deadline, like you said, it's a gig. You have to get paid. So it's like I try to just get in there like a, a, a com compartmentalize and put myself in a fenced in yard and just try to play and run around and have fun until it seems like it's starting to flow. But it's, it's work as opposed to just being like, I can't wait to do this. You know, it's do you have a um. Like for me, I have like certain hacks. Like I like to meditate. I like to exercise or eat well. There's certain things I do that I know have a positive impact on my inspiration or my creativity, or my session. Do you have, do you meditate? Do you have a spiritual practice? Do you do something that you know physically, mentally, emotionally, whatever, spiritually will put you in that place? I, um, I don't meditate. I exercise. When I was younger, before my knees gave out, I ran a lot. I, I ran, um, like 20 some odd marathons. And, and actually for a while, my goal, my, my goal was to be the only idiot on the planet to, to run 50 marathons and to publish 50 books. I figured nobody else has, had ever done that. No, oh. Probably because it never occurred to anybody to do that. <laughs> right. And my knees gave out right around, I can't remember if it was 22 or 23 marathons, but during these long runs, you know, some of these runs are two hours, you know, your training runs. I find that I would be able to think clearly and organize whatever trouble spots I had been um, encountering in the previous day's work or in that day's work. And somehow I'd be able to kind of fight my way through those trouble spots while I was running. I was, my head was clear. There were no distractions. I didn't have a cell phone. There was no screen mm. staring at me, no kids screaming at me. So that was a very useful part of the process. The The only hack I, I, um, I have now, it, it probably would only um, resonate with writers, although maybe, um, maybe in your work, it would, it would be meaningful as well. I try to start off the next session before I leave the one I'm working on, mm -hmm. you know, so, so if I feel a sense of closure and I've completed what I needed to do that day before I sign off for the day, I'll try to start in on tomorrow's work. So, so that I, I kind of hit the ground running a little yeah. bit. If, if I do it right, and it's not like you're going from zero to 60. You're only going from 43 to 60. It makes it easier to start the next day. I do the same thing. Yeah, I, do. I, I try to like prep my canvas. Like I'm, I have a canvas behind me. I prepped for my next project. I try to like take steps forward. And it also kind of like reminds you that no matter how hard or challenging the thing you're on now, there's something else behind it. So it kind of like keeps that momentum going forward. Right. Um, uh, so you do, I mean, I imagine, I imagine your life is, was similar to what mine was early on before I discovered the joys of, of book writing. You know, when I was a journalist, a freelance journalist, I spent as much time hustling for assignments and selling the work as I did actually producing the work. And to me, that was maddening. Um, and I would have to, in order to make a decent living, I would have to write two or three or six pieces a week, you know, some of these pieces would pay a hundred bucks, 150 bucks. I used to write for the daily news. I think they paid $150 yeah. for uh, for a freelance piece. And, um, but then all of a sudden I got a book contract and I had six months to do it and I didn't have to chase and I didn't have to hustle. And my days could be just about 
the work, and I don't know if there's an equivalent, maybe it's a big commission piece in your world, but you're knocking out piece after piece after piece, right? Lately, yes. That's not how I started my career. I started my painting thing took off at the moment that I, well, first of all, at the moment that I declared it, once I kind of said, once I quit my old business that I worked on for 15 years, I kind of just left it and said, I'm, I'm now a painter. And I declared to the world, I am a painter. And from that moment on, it just kind of worked. But I would be taking like three or f- two, three, sometimes even four months on one painting. And then that became like my major release for the next certain amount of time. And then I would work on the next one. Lately, though, especially since having kids, your expenses go crazy. So I've been definitely working faster. But there, there's def- there 100% is a parallel, which is one of the reasons I find it so fascinating, like hearing about another creative person's process. I, I'm, I'm also, this yeah. is like, this is a complete tangent, but I'm curious where like the, um, cause this is an overlap to a lot of my, my audience are very like, um, ocean based people, naturey people like, like yourself. I know you love the ocean. Like you have this, um, we have this overlap where I th- we, last time we talked, we sort of kind of agreed that maybe we originally met through Izzy Paskowitz through Surfer's Healing. We did. Yeah, and I think we we determined that conclusively. Yeah, I think yes, so. We did meet through Izzy. Yeah. We, we both ended yes. up following each other. We're like, who followed who and how? And so you have like, but you also did a book for like with Bob Hurley. So you have like this surfing thing, and you, you live near the ocean. Like, where did your connection, both business and interest in ocean and surf and cult, that kind of culture and that life, where did that? Uh, how did that happen? You know, my interest in, in surfing really came out of my interest in Izzy and the stuff of his life. Okay. Um, Izzy reached out to me to help him share his story um, because of a book I had done a few years earlier with a young autistic man in Rochester, New York, um, who um, was a ma- mainstreamed in high school in Rochester. And you might remember, he was known as J-Mac. You might remember this moment that kind of went viral uh, where this uh, young kid was carried as the team manager because, the, and as a kindness, the coach put him in at the end of the last game of his senior year. And this kid, Jason, J Mac, just lit up the gym. He drained eight three pointers uh, in the space of four minutes. And the place went crazy. Somebody caught it on video. It became ESPN's, you know, SB sports moment of the year. And I wound up writing a book about uh, with this young man. Uh, about his life and Izzy or someone in Izzy's circle saw this book and introduced the two of us. For your listeners who don't know Izzy's story, Izzy is the fourth son of nine children uh, born to this uh, crazy, loopy, out there, Stanford-educated Jewish doctor who decided after obtaining his medical degree and starting to spit out all these kids, at some point he decided early on, maybe kid three or kid four, that the world was too much with him and he just didn't like to practice medicine and he wanted to surf for the rest of his life. And he was going to, his job was to repopulate the state of Israel with uh, Jewish men and, and to raise surfers. And so Izzy and his eight siblings were raised in a 24 foot uh, camper and they traveled the planet. They went up and down the West coast, up and down the East coast they, they took the first surfboards to Israel. Izzy's father, Doc Paskowitz, is credited with bringing the sport to the beaches of Tel Aviv, which is mm. kind of cool. There was a documentary on this family uh, called Surfwise that played at Sundance about 12 years ago, right around the time Izzy and I had met. The third act of the story, Izzy's part of the story, is Izzy became a world champion longboard surfer out of this crazy, nutty childhood. Um, and his oldest son, Isaiah, is profoundly autistic. And what Izzy discovered uh, once he got over the, um, the grieving at not being able to raise a surfer in his image the way his father had raised a surfer in his image was that his son did better after spending a day uh, on the waves with his dad. Um, and that soon in the beaches of California, you know, people on the spectrum, you know, friends of Isaiah's through school would see Izzy surfing in tandem with Isaiah and they'd ask him, you know, could you take my kid out surfing? And this kind of grew organically in a Pied Piper sort of way to where Izzy and his wife, Danielle, Danielle started this foundation called Surfers Healing that now runs about 25 camps each year. They take about 5,000 kids surfing uh, each year. 
and they lift kids from uh, their place on the spectrum to a place where they begin to believe and their families begin to believe that anything is possible to them. So Izzy tapped me to write this book. And when he did, uh, I was interested in his story. And I said to him, look, Izzy, I'll write your book. But in exchange, you have to teach me how to surf. No way. And that's that's true, huh? That, that that was the bargain. And I must tell you uh, that I did a much better job holding up my end of the bargain because I'm a shitty surfer. <laughs> I'm, really, I'm really not a good surfer. So he was able to get me up on a wave. Uh, uh, I could paddle out past a normal size Jones Beach size or, or a, um, uh, a you know Jersey Shore kind of break. Uh, I have a lot of difficulty timing the wave and paddling into a wave, and I am useless in navigating a wave to keep myself away from somebody else. So if I'm on my own wave and I can get a little help uh, on the timing, I can ride it to shore. But if, God forbid, anybody's on this wave with me, I'm a dead man. And so, too, are they (laughs) a dead man. Just a quick break, everyone. I don't have any fancy sponsors to tell you about, but I do have a small ask. If you're not already familiar with my artwork, I would love if you checked it out. You can go on jalders.com or check me out on social media at jalders. Uh, My art is the main method that I use to support my family, and that is something that would, um, you know, any support would really be appreciated. Also, you can check out my online shop for merchandise, apparel, and all kinds of other cool tchotchkes. I also have a newsletter that goes out about every week or two. I'm not overly strict about it like I should be, but I send out updates of my artwork, things that are going on, new collaborations, things of that sort. I also have a book coming out, my first book, which I've been working on for about five years. It's been a tremendous focus of my passion and um, more details on that soon, but I do expect it to be coming out in about late fall. So please sign up for my free newsletter on my website. Please uh, stay on my social media with me. I will be announcing more information on that in the next week or two as I get more updates from my editors and book designers. So that's my exciting news. I'm actually almost at the finish line. Those of you that have been following me for uh, a number of years now have been hearing me tease about it. And uh, the finish line is within sight I am really nervous. I'm really excited. Uh, I'm really anxious to uh, share this project with you. It's one of the things I'm most proud of that I've created. So uh, that's that's my news. Back to the conversation with Daniel. Hope you love the rest of it. I, I think uh, surfing is one of those activities, as as it sounds like you know, that like very very few people are good at. And I'm I'm certainly not. Uh, a master by any means. I'm. I'm still after after. I've been surfing since I was like 17, and I still suck. It's but it's it's fun. Really? You know, it's one of those things that you can you can be terrible at, and uh, no one next to you really cares unless you do something dangerous and hurt them. But otherwise, or you steal their wave, then they then they'll care. But other than that, it's like you can be out there with your buddies and have fun, and maybe only catch a couple. And so much of the fun is just hanging out there with your buddies in the lineup and chatting and like being somewhere without a cell phone and looking around and seeing the seagulls fly by and like being part of nature that maybe that's uh has something to do with like the autistic um benefit to it it's just uh there was there's a real tangible and and quantifiable benefit um uh in fact my wife who's a shrink uh, and my daughter who's a shrink did a study of i think 700 surface healing families and they tried to um you know, uh, kind of identify what it was exactly about this experience that was transformative, what was transformative in a lasting way, what made an impact just for the next day or so. And but there's a a real benefit. And and as you said, it's the it's the sensory uh, change. It's the isolation. It's being out there in a place that's unfamiliar in an unfamiliar environment and dialing in to this new environment. And for a lot of kids who are uh, somewhat mainstreamed and are um, able to verbalize what they're experiencing. For a lot of kids, they recognize that they're doing something rad and cool. Yeah. Izzy calls it extreme special ed. <laughs> and and one kid actually uh, who I worked with, I've become involved with this organization. So I wrote this book with Izzy 10 years ago. 
And I still bounce around to these camps with him. And I go travel with him uh, wherever I can, whatever my schedule um, allows. And, and my wife and I both have become very active in the organization. And I was working with a, a young man who was probably about 13 or 14 a couple of summers ago. And he just was so jazzed about uh, about his ride. He was out in the water for about 30 minutes with uh, a lovely young man from Puerto Rico who was helping him get up on a board. And I said to him, what, so what's so great about this? Why are you smiling so much? And he says, I'm going to be able to go to school on Monday for show and tell. And I have something to tell the other kids that I did that they're going to think is cool. So how great is that, that you can lift these kids from, you know, the reality of their days to a place where they can think, start to think that anything is possible. So yeah, um, that's true, man. That was, that was great. So that's where my, so, so I got good enough to be able to paddle out and like you, I, I would hang out outside and just, and just bullshit with the other surfers and they'd be going in to catch their waves and they'd paddle back out and see me still out there. And they say, what about you? I said, no, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll ride, I'll ride in at the end of the day or I'll, I'll hang with you over beers, you know, on, on the shore afterwards. That to me is, what surfing is it's the camaraderie. So I bought that part of it yeah that, yeah that part i bought into yeah it's like the culture and the camaraderie is is real and it's it, it is cool just you know like you said just positioning yourself in the lineup you're getting a a view and a perspective of of life and and the coast that most people don't get like most people that aren't sitting out there don't know what it's like to have you know a, a modest size wave break and being behind it and having the water spray you and it's 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 an amazing experience visually aesthetically you know just spiritually and um yeah it's, it, there's something about it that just uh kind of fulfills checks off a lot of really amazing parts of life for right, sure right it's it's interesting I mean, it's that, interesting that you bring it's interesting that you bring up Izzy though because you know some of these books that I work on are with big celebrity name above the title type people. Some of them are with, you know, out of the way, ordinary folks who just do something extraordinary or they've experienced something extraordinary. And Izzy would be an example of the latter. And I find when I work with, with people like that, um, who have not grown up with a microphone or a camera in their face, and they're not used to telling the same story again and again for an audience, there's something fresh and vibrant and real that you can help pull for them from them and set out into the world between hard covers. Those books to me feel like a much more creative uh, endeavor than some of these celebrity books that I do. Not that there isn't value in those books as well, but those books are familiar to the subject, to the person who's telling me the story. And so it, become, it starts to feel familiar to me. And it's not as challenging as, as sort of diving in for the first time. I'm seeing like the similarity. You were describing yourself when you were in school about how you just like to give people kind of like give them a smile, give them a laugh, give them a kick. And it's like it's it's so cool, like hearing that and then sort of putting the other bookend on where you are now, where you're you and your wife and your family are still involved with like surfers healing. And so much of that really is about putting a smile on someone's face, giving them a laugh, letting them have fun. Yeah. Like that seems to be like a, a something, a consistent theme throughout your life. Is that. Well, maybe, but I think, but these smiles, these surfers healing smiles are, they're consequential smiles. Yeah. The smiles, you know, of, of adolescence were just goofball smiles, you know, but I think we really do, I, I say we, Izzy and Danielle and the rest of these warrior surfers, I and mean, he's got the best surfers on the planet that he recruits 100%. to join him as volunteers, you know, what they're doing um, is is really moving the lives, the needle in the lives of these people, uh, which is yeah. great. Yeah, I've I've been to several events myself, and uh, it's just it's something everyone should try to uh, be involved with. Some something along those lines of giving back. It, there's one thing about giving money and, and doing things like that, but when you could be at an event like that and know and see tangibly and measurably like the the work you're doing, and then just being on an outside perspective, I've been to some events of theirs where the waves were like too big where I'm not comfortable going out and helping someone that's bigger than me or, you know, I can't control. And so it's, it's very admirable and respectable and impressive that how they can manage the, the children and the waves, no matter what the conditions are. And it's, you could see the, the smiles on their faces, you know, it's working and that's, that is incredible. And that's, there, I think there is a correlation, honestly, with, with being a writer or an artist or something like that, where you're, where you're giving back. There is, 
something magical about the validation that you get with those sorts of things. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think, um, I just heard a little feedback on me, Jay. Did you, are you hearing feedback or no. is that just me? No, I, you sound okay. okay over here. Okay. Now it's gone. So you can edit that little blip out. That's okay. Um, no, I think you're, I think you're right. And in fact, I think I might remember, uh, one of those big days, uh, at Belmar where, where it might be that you and I met yeah. in, on the Jersey shore. Um, you know, where, where the lifeguards are there and they're saying, you know, are you sure you want to be out there with these, with these kids? Yep. And we were towing kids out in jet skis because, you know, the surf was too gnarly to try to paddle out with these kids. You know, you have to imagine some of these kids, when we start out with them are reluctant customers. You know, you mm-hmm. might find a, a young 20 year old man on the spectrum who weighs 250 pounds. And if he doesn't want to be on that board, it might take a village to persuade him that he wants to be on that board. So you've got four or five people uh, struggling with this kid, trying to uh, calm him down and, and, and keep him safe and, and, and calm uh, on a surfboard until he can get out past the break where things Mm -hmm. settle down a little bit and he can get his wits about him. Um, And that big surf, you know, when it's head high, sometimes it it does not help. I want to ask you about luck versus lucky yep. breaks versus making your own opportunities being the author of your own life uh, clearly both of those have a a role in any creative person's success i'm i'm super curious dan how you went from this kind of like self-described class clown guy making laughs and doing like the newspaper and all that to like becoming a journalist to and then you're writing books and now you're you know mixed in with these very influential people like are there certain moments, I guess, what were the, some of the earlier moments where it was like, holy crap, this is a really big thing. Like things are shifting in my life right now, like for the better career wise. Like were those more to do with luck? Were those more to do with you positioning yourself? Can you kind of go off on a tangent on those sorts of topics? Yeah. I mean, I think there was a lot of luck involved and, and some of it was, was dumb luck. Uh, but in retrospect, when you look, you know, kind of in the rear view mirror and see where you've been, uh, I did one thing that turned out to be very strategic. Uh, and that was I, I went to work. The only real job I've ever had it lasted for about 18 months. And I, I went to work for Simon and Schuster back in the very early 80s as a publicist. Uh, so I would write, you know, flap copy uh, for the hardcover books and press releases and help to arrange book tours uh, for people who are sort of bouncing around the country promoting their books. But what the experience gifted me was access to the publishing world. You know, I learned how that industry worked. And I, more important, I learned the players. You know, I, I became um, acquainted with, you know, big time editors at Simon & Schuster at a time, you know, when Simon & Schuster was making noise and publishing meaningful books. And I, I knew the publisher and I knew the marketing person and I, and I knew literary agents that interacted with these editors. So uh, it wasn't really a scheming or strategic move on my part actively, but looking back, it, it had that effect because without really realizing it, I'd laid some sort of groundwork uh, and started to build a network of, uh, of experiences and contacts that I could call upon as I, as I move forward. And in fact, it was because of the kindnesses of a couple of the people at Simon and Schuster that I was able to land my first ghostwriting gig. The folks there kind of knew that I wanted to be a writer working at a publishing house is not a place to be. If you wanted to be a writer, that's, that's kind of crazy. Um, but, um, so they knew I wasn't long for that job. And, and, uh, one of them threw me a bone and said, look, we just, we just signed a book with Willard Scott across the street. He was at NBC at 30 yeah. Rock across across the street from Simon & Schuster. They said, why don't you walk over there? He needs a writer. If he likes you, you can write his book. It's fine with us. They'd never really seen any of my work other than these stupid press releases and bits of flap copy. <laughs> I go over to see Willard. Willard pours me a, a, a Jack Daniels. It's, it's, it's late in the afternoon, so it's okay. And we have a little drink. And he says, basically, he says, what the hell do I care if Simon & Schuster says... <laughs> You're right. It's all right with me. And I wound up writing a book with with Willard Scott. So on the one hand, that's luck, uh, and right. absolutely dumb luck, blind luck. But it, it also came out of something that made sense. And if it had been a strategy going in, it would have been a smart strategy. 
so what was the driving force then? Like you, you're, you're, you're making it sound almost as though it was just like, oh, whoops, I just accidentally ended up in this place. And like, oh, I just so happened to be schmoozing and mingling and I had the right shtick that everyone got along with. Like, are you just that charismatic naturally? Or like, was there a driving force of like in the back of your head? Like, I want to be in these places to meet the right people because I had a, a vision. Okay, so I, so- so I, I left out a big piece of the story okay. in the interest of economy, but I see that what's happened is I've, I've just confused the hell out of you and your listeners. <laughs> I'm just curious. So, I'm super curious. <laughs> so the, the missing piece to that story is while I was at school, I won an award that Simon & Schuster, which was then owned by Gulf & Western, it was a Gulf & Western publishing scholarship. So I won this award, which paid for my last year of school, but it came with the stipulation that you go work for Simon & Schuster for a year upon graduation. So because all I ever wanted to be was a writer, I didn't really think it through. This was the era, era of Woodward and Bernstein. I wanted to be a swashbuckling journalist, an investigative reporter. I wanted to travel the world and, and write and write wrongs and, and, and make a difference. Um, but I had no real idea what, what that meant and how I would turn that into a living of some kind. So they're dangling this scholarship, which was great. And I grabbed at that. And then I'm thinking about this job. Okay, well, it's a job. They're going to pay me. It wasn't anything I really wanted to do. But I figured, you know, it it bought me the scholarship. So I might as well give them the year and see what happened. So I forgot to mention that part of the story because I thought it muddied the waters. But in fact, it really clarifies things and (laughs) calms the waters a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So that's why I was that's why I was there at Simon and Schuster, and that's why I kind of had portfolio at Simon and Schuster to talk to some of the big players there. It wasn't just because I was this charming kid; it was because I was the Simon and Schuster scholar or the Gulf and Western scholar or whatever they were calling me. So you so, just sort of like incrementally like got got some more clout, a little more clout, and meet people a little and, more uh, clout. Very, very organically. So, Right. So the other, you know, rookie 23 year old who was working at the desk next to me didn't have that same sort of agency, I guess. Um, so in that respect, uh, I was um, I was fortunate and I took advantage of that. But not again, not not scheming, not meaning to take advantage of it, right. but it worked out to the good. Is there any advice that you might have for for writers in particular, like younger writers now, because it's such a different world now like self-publishing is there and there's like less barrier of entry than there was and like every everyone under the sun is accessible at least some way through social media like making contacts and connections and getting information it's so different now than when like when you started or even when I first started is there uh, are there lessons that carry through that are sort of evergreen that you can kind of share with a young writer listening I mean, I think the only thing that's a constant between now and, you know, 1982, 84, 86, when I was doing these things for the first time, is that you just have to put yourself out there and do it. You know, so uh, even when no one's paying for you or inviting you into the party, you need to sit down and write. If you want to be a writer, write. If you want to be a painter, paint. Nobody's going to give you permission or hold the door open for you. So do these things and do them with a song in your heart and hope for the best, but do them with with confidence, even if there's no immediate return on, on your investment. Uh, because in the doing, presumably, you'll make yourself a better writer or painter or surfer or whatever it is your yeah. pursuit is. You know, there is a beauty uh, and there is a benefit in, in the doing. Um, Yes, there are um, fewer barriers to entry today in publishing, for example. But, you know, that said, I believe, you know, there's still um, uh, a difference in the way a a book that comes from a major publishing house or even independent publishing house is regarded when you hold it up against a Mm self-published novel. You know, self-published books are still not reviewed. They're not they're not going to be found on a shelf at a bookstore. You don't find them in the library. So they exist in a way that, you know, you can buy them from the back of the author's trunk after he does an appearance somewhere, but um, they exist on another plane than uh, than books that come through conventional publishing sources. Can you talk to me about um, a lot? Another thing a lot of people that are creative struggle with, understandably, is criticism. Now, you already mentioned earlier that you, you sort of keep your ego at bay. 
Um, I'm curious about like mindset and how, if there's anything particular that any mindsets or self narration or some kind of little, you know, tricks or advice you might have for people when, when you are new, especially those first initial criticisms are really hard to take. Um, have you dealt with any particular criticisms um, of your work that were maybe particularly harsh or does it just go over your head? It, you know, uh, even early on, it never affected you. Like, can you talk about that? I think I'm lucky Jay in that uh, I'm insulated a little bit from um, criticism in the kind of work that I do um, in the books that I write for myself. I'm insulated uh, from criticism because I'm, arrogant so i think anybody who's criticizing me is wrong good <laughs> but, Love but, it. but but in the books that i write for other people i'm always able to tell myself well they're they're really criticizing the celebrity they're criticizing the choices that he or she made uh in their life or or in that movie or in that big game moment um they're not criticizing me so I'm I'm kind of bulletproof, or at least I fool myself into thinking I'm bulletproof, and and the criticism doesn't apply to me. In the books I write for myself, um, you know, the stories I tell myself are uh, that they're wrong and and I'm right. But the truth <laughs> is, it. you know, not a whole lot of people are reading my books. There must be a reason it has you know that goes beyond the size of my platform and that I'm not be, not able to find a big audience. It's possible that what I write is small and introspective and it's, it's not a kind of page turner audience grabbing piece of fiction. And in so far as anybody might criticize me for that, I suppose they're right. You know, not a lot of shit happens in the, in the novels that I write. I think there's and, I think there's lessons there for sure. You know, I mean, just just having the narration of like kind of f f them, like who the hell cares what they think? That's on bulletproof. Those are probably things that are helpful to carry on, right? Like, right. But but I'm also stupid enough to think, and again, arrogant enough to think that if I wanted to write a page turning Scott Turow, John Grisham, Stephen King kind of bestseller, that I could. And it's just that I simply choose not to. Now, of course, that's not true. I'd love it if my books happen in a bigger way. Uh, but I content myself that they happen at all. And that, you know, I hear back from a, a few people and, and they have found something to like and admire and hold out or maybe recommend to another reader, which is which is kind of great. The last book that I uh, published was uh, three or four years ago, a small independent press called Relegation Books took this book on. Um, and the book meant a great deal to me. I'd been noodling with the idea for many years before I actually got around to write it. And the themes of that book actually speak into a little bit uh, what we're talking about here, about what it means to uh, leave a legacy or have people notice your work. Um, and it was disappointing to me when that book didn't make more noise upon publication. Mm. But then I stepped back from that and said, well, it was published. It got some attention. Don't be greedy. Um, but maybe there is some value to the criticism that I do hear that it would be good if more stuff happened in my books. You mentioned legacy. What do you think is or what do you want your legacy to be speaking upon your career? I know you're, I know you're a very proud dad and you have other much very important parts of your life. But as far as your writing goes, I guess I'm curious, what do you think makes your writing style different? And what do you think your legacy, professionally speaking, is? You know, I don't really know. That's a good question. And I, I really never considered that before because a lot of what I do and a lot, whatever writing style I have, um, it's often set aside for most of the work that I do, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the work that I do when I'm writing as Serena Williams, let's say, or Damon John, let's say, or Denzel Washington is very different than the work I do when I'm writing as myself. So I don't really know that a discerning reader would be able to find a through line between all these books that I've done and be able to point to a particular style. Maybe in my own novels, yes. I've, I've written a few books of nonfiction of my own, so maybe there, yes. But 
what's great about the legacy I built, the bookshelf that I've amassed of these other titles, there's probably 50 or more of them now, of books I've written with other people, is that each one is so dramatically different than the other. And I think that's kind of a pretty rich legacy to leave behind, that I'm able to walk in the shoes of so many other people and to breathe life into their stories uh, and to put them out into the world on their behalf uh, in, in a way that those stories live on after they're no longer here. So that's kind of great to be able to have had a hand in that, I think. Um, and also, and this one is not on me. I think this is a change across the industry. But when I started doing this, there were very few people who did this kind of work repeatedly. You know, there were there were a lot of journalists who would do this in a one-off way. You know, somebody who covered a baseball team for years might take a leave of absence from his paper to to spend six months writing that star's uh, autobiography at the end of his career, somebody from that team. And then they'd go back to their day job. But in the mid-80s, there were maybe three or four people doing this uh, uh, in a repeated, uh, sustaining way like I was doing. Now you can find 30 or 40 or more people doing that. And I think that speaks to a change in the publishing industry. But I also think it, it, it's, uh, it's somehow uh, because uh, it has something to do with the way the books that came out in the 80s and the 90s helped to erase the stigma of having somebody help you write your book. I think, I think the nature of the work has changed maybe in some small way because of the good work that that ghostwriters were doing in collaboration back in in uh, in the 80s and and in the 90s i did a book once with um with Whoopi goldberg uh that was called book mm -hmm. and i i wasn't credited on the cover there because the publisher which and it might have been simon and schuster by the way coincidentally but I can't remember for sure, but the publisher decided, look, you know, Whoopi's fans know her as an artist, as a comedian. There's an expectation that she writes her own material. We don't want to distance her from her fans and put in this other layer. Um, so she's going to stand as the only writer of this book. And that was kind of fine with me. It was less fine with Whoopi, which I thought was kind of cool. And she ended up writing with, with help from me. But instead of an acknowledgement, she wrote a whole chapter in her book about what it is to receive help and what it means to receive kindness and what it and how affirmative action has played into her life and in into the lives of, of so many black people at the time when this book came out, which was in the early 90s, I think. And, and why is it that we believe uh, that there is um, something to be embarrassed about when you receive a helping hand from somebody else? Why wouldn't you admit that? So she turned this notion of, of burying my name and keeping it off the cover and grew it into a kind of think piece on, on the nature of aid and, and what it means to, to be in need and to accept aid and help gracefully, which I thought was kind of cool. That sounds to me like a legacy. If you're able to, um, if you're able to shift the mindset and the thinking of your subject or your collaborators that you're writing about, that sure as heck says a lot about what your process is like. And I'm, I want to ask you about that next. You're, you know, what is it like? Not the ego part, not like, ooh, I'm working with, you know, um, Ray Lewis or Denzel Washington. Like, that's a whole other cool subject. But, like, more so, I want to know what it's like when you're one-on-one -on -one with these people. Is it is it um, sitting down for coffee for, like, a few weeks? Is it you get recordings sent to you? Are there Are there or have there ever been, like, kind of pinch-me moments? Like, this is so cool. I'm hanging out with, like, Damon John from Shark Tank or, like, you know, or, or is it more like um, – you're just hanging out with a buddy and you're getting to know each other. Like what is the, pro what is the process like? What does a really great collaboration feel like? Like some of your better ones? Well, they're, they're all different. Uh, I mean, the, the best way to, and, and now in, in the zoom times, these post pandemic times, <clears throat> it's changed yet again because it was all done kind of long distance. Ideally, I want to be in the room with the person I'm working with. And not only that, I want to be in their room. I want to find somebody where they live. I want to see them in their comfort zone, in their natural habitat. 
Um, it works best, I think, when I have the ability to osmose the way they live. If I can stay with them for a couple of days, that's great. Uh, and that's often worked out, and that's been the case. If I can travel with them, um, you know, that's great. I did a book a couple of years ago with Steve Aoki, uh, and Steve Aoki famously does not sit still. He performs, you know, like 300 shows a year, 250 shows a year. The only time we could actually sit still and, and do the work where I can actually run a tape and, and download the stuff of his life in a way that I can write about it was for me to travel with him. And I lived on a tour bus with him for a week and we did our work, you know, the middle of the night when he finished the show at two or three in the morning, everybody else on the crew would go to sleep and he and I would sit up as the bus rambled into the next town and we'd, you know, we'd bang out some material that was, uh, that was kind of great. Um, you know, so, so those experiences are rich and they're a whole lot of fun and different, but they're also, um, the yield there is great because you get to see somebody in their own environment. You get to see them as they, as they truly are uh, when they're being themselves, you know, every other, if it's a, if it's a celebrated person, every other time a journalist is sitting with them asking questions, it's almost an adversarial construct, right? right? The journalist wants something from them. They're there looking to uh, make a story or to, or to fill, uh, to fill their deadline. When I'm there, I'm there at their pleasure. I'm there to extract the story that they want to tell, that they're meant to tell, that they might not realize that they want to tell until I help to pull it out of them. So the relationship is, the dynamic is very different than it typically is uh, with a, a journalist and his subject. It's, I'm it's not so a journalist. I'm kind of something other. What I'm finding really interesting is you said like your children as well as your wife are in psychology of some sort. You said they're shrinks. But right. and I, yes. I, I know from my experience in, in working on my book, I, ha I have a developmental editor, Anne, who is pretty much as close to a therapist as you can imagine. There's definitely something about that, isn't there, where you are stepping in and it's not adversarial. It's more like you're taking an uh, extreme um, isolated interest and focus on, on these people in a way that they're probably not used to from total strangers. And, they're, and you're able to... Um, shift and help them think about their lives in a way they probably haven't thought of, and you're able to encapsulate lessons and things that maybe were just isolated incidents, and you're able to turn it into uh, a rhythmic, um, almost a song. Like I know, I, I so I, for instance, read a couple of Damon John's books that you wrote, and there is a song-like quality where there is a like almost like a, a hook to it, like a mental intellectual hook, as well as a uh, a melody throughout the book that keeps your attention. And I could definitely see the humor in it. And I can imagine that must, with someone like Damon, who seems to have a great sense of humor as well, it must have been really cool to be able to point out, or I would imagine, I'm imagining here, it must have been cool to point out things like, hey, Damon, did you realize this part of your life actually connects to that part and how this has cohesiveness to that? Like, that that hitting the ball back and forth for, uh, back and forth must be so fun. Is that so fun for you? Yeah, it, yeah. No, I think you're. I think you're right. It, it, it's it's. I don't know. If the fun is the right word. It, be, it it sometimes becomes sort of a challenging puzzle that you're trying to solve together. So it's it's engaging. It's intellectually um, a curious. Yeah. Um, sometimes sometimes there's fun involved, but sometimes um, it's it's more of of a constant puzzle that you're trying to work. And, and sometimes there are happy accidents where things do connect uh, in a way that's great. I think what I wind up doing, going back to your uh, the first, the front part of that comment you made about the, the shrink and the psychology therapist piece is I'm able to ask these people questions that they might be unwilling to ask themselves. Right. right. Um, and I can push them in places that they're not prepared to go on their own. Um, and I can do so with impunity because I'm really there as their mouthpiece. I'm there to help them figure out what the story is and how best to tell it. And the worst case scenario is I hit a sore spot, they clam up, we move on. Um, or they tell me a story that really doesn't work or belong and we move on from that. Or they tell me a story that they regret telling me and they say, well, forget about it. That's not for publication. Yeah. Um, but I need to push those buttons. The trick comes in knowing when to push them. You know, if I push them too early, I might shut them off for the run of the project. Right. I did a book many years ago. It's one of my favorite books. 
actually. And when you talk about a book having the feeling of a song and having something lyrical about it, this one really felt to me like a long song poem. It was a book I wrote with Anthony Quinn called One Man Tango. And Anthony Quinn, for your listeners who don't remember who he was, he was this legendary uh, uh, um, Hollywood actor, four-time Academy Award winner, won twice, uh, best known probably for Zorba the Greek. Uh, he was in Lawrence of Arabia. He was a product of the old studio system. He married Cecil B. DeMille's daughter. He was a Hollywood icon. Yeah. And when I was meeting him, he was 80 years old, but he was also a terrific painter. You should study his artwork and his sculpture. He was enormously, abundantly talented. He showed in galleries all over the world. Um, and uh, But he was getting on in, uh, in, in years. And I knew from researching his life that when he was a young father, tragically, he had a three-year-old son who drowned in his neighbor's Mm -hmm. swimming pool. Uh, His neighbor was W.C. Fields, and his son just sort of wandered uh, over the backyard fence or through the hedges, and they found him. And it was an awful, horrible story. But I knew that I wouldn't be serving Tony if I didn't bring that up or make him address that in some way in his book. He was an artist. He was all about keeping it real and raw and honest. But I also knew that if I did that right out of the gate, I would lose him. You know, I needed to establish a certain amount of trust and there needed to be a certain amount of road beneath our tires together before I could ask him that. And at some point, months into the process, we got there and and his memories, whatever we tapped, produced a really rich thread. I felt like a shit heel for making him go there, but that was why he brought me on. I figured that was my job. But we got a very lovely thread that we use in the in the book where he shared that the ghost of his son has been with him in the 50 or 60 years since his death, that he still talks to this little boy whose name is Christopher, and he sort of imagines him in his life as kind of a spirit guide. Uh, and that never would have come up And we never would have had those aspects of the story if I didn't make Tony go through those difficult paces. So, uh, you know, there's again, it's not always fun, but it is always an interesting and curious challenge when you uh, when you do when you go about this the right way. Yeah, fun is probably the wrong word, but fulfilling maybe because, you know, everything like surfing, making art, making writing books, like raising children, a lot of the process could at times feel torturous for any of these things but when that when that problem of the moment is solved and when you get in those little moments like those little segments of flow state that's the fun and then it's like the rest of the process you're kind of chasing after the next flow state and chasing after the next right, one right, and it's right. like torture ah oh, this sucks ah get away from me and it's like ah oh, this feels good and it's like those right. <laughs> it's like surfing you could be surfing for like 4 hours with your buddies but you only catch like 15 seconds of waves Right. right. It's, it's right. nonsensical, but it's like somehow that's fun, even though most of it's like just paddling or being underwater, or like getting a board hit in your head. Like, so it's it's kind of similar in that regard. Right. Like, I'm, yes, I'm, yes, yes. I'm, I'm like also before we wrap up, I have a couple more questions. If you're OK with time. Yeah, I'm good. Sure. Um, I'm super. So we, we kind of touched upon how I, I really do think that you're probably sharing information, wisdom. Um, teaching. There's a lot of teaching moments, probably, I would assume, working with you for your clients. I'm wondering, are there specific moments or lessons or instances that you've, let's say, worked with like a Serena Williams or an Anthony Quinn or, you know, any of your clients, Damon John, I keep going back to Damon John. He's like one of my favorite sharks, but you're working with one of these people and afterwards you're like, holy shit, I learned a lot of stuff or like, Hey, can I have a stock tip? Or like, is there, are there learning moments coming in the other way as well? Yes, there are many learning moments. Damon was kind enough to tell me to never get into the liquor business at a time in my life when I had just gotten into the liquor business. So that would have been good to know (laughs) before, before I tried to start my own tequila. Okay. Um, But um, so that would have been good to know. Yes. Certainly when I work with some of these world-class athletes, there are inspirational takeaways on, uh, on motivation and, and determination and, and how you can grow your own game. And just, just through a painstaking commitment, just live a bigger, better 
richer life by by recognizing uh, with this kind of singular lens that some of these great athletes have to adopt in order to be great athletes. And how do you attach that lens to your own life? I thought it was very useful and meaningful. You know, most of these people, and even even the anonymous people like like Izzy or or a woman I, I um, worked with a few years ago who um, survived a horrible ordeal during the Holocaust when she was seven years old. She lived in the sewers of Lvov, Poland for 14 months with her family to escape the Nazis. You know, these are all, they're heroic stories. They're larger than life stories, even if you've never heard of them until the book comes out. Um, so I think just by virtue of these people all having lived book-worthy lives, uh, lives that have something that that leaves enough of a trail or a footprint that other people can learn from them. Just for me to be able to soak that up in such an up close way with a front row seat uh, is is a rich and and boundless gift that I've been given, and it changes with each project. You know, six, after six months, I'm on to the next one, and I'll meet another wonderful or interesting um, or or creative someone. Uh, which is great. Whether they're famous or not, I think they all have something to share. This young autistic boy who scored 20 points in the last four minutes of his last high school game of his career had something to share. Um, A bilateral amputee mountaineer who lost his legs on Mount McKinley, who decided that the only way he was going to get his life back under control is if he beats the mountain that beat him mountain becomes sort of his great white whale and he has to climb that mountain on his prosthetic legs in order to become whole and he does so he has something to teach yeah. me as well so uh yes don't get into the liquor business <laughs> and and yes if it works out that you lose your legs due to frostbite on mount mckinley climb that sucker <laughs> go back and climb that sucker <laughs> those are the lessons <laughs> are there um are there traits or habits or uh, is there a common thread? Because a lot, you know, a lot, in, and I'm not asking just about your clients, although I am asking about your clients, but I'm also asking about yourself. Like there's a lot of writers that would amputate both their legs to be in your career position, right? To use a, a very horrible <laughs> metaphor or analogy. Um, and there, likewise, there are a lot, ton of people that would love to be in the shoes of many of your clients, except for ha- perhaps for, uh, not the person with the amputee uh, legs, but other people's shoes that you've worked with, there'd be a lot of people that would want to be in those positions, and yet they're not. And there's a, millions of writers that are not where you are. Are there ch- traits? Are there habits? Are there mindsets that overlap consistently? That's a book I would love to read by Daniel Paisner, is, is something like that. I would, can you tell me something about that? Like, yeah, I think you could find it in the probably in the flippant remark I made early in this conversation when you asked how I dealt with criticism and and the way I deal with it is by not dealing with it by telling myself that they don't know what the fuck they're talking about, right? <laughs> yes. They're wrong. So I think that sort of arrogance but it's not really arrogance, it's it's believing in yourself. It's it's trusting that you know a thing or two and maybe the folks around you don't know the same thing or two. And I think that's the through line that you find in a lot of successful people, or at least high achieving people who've, who've high achieved enough that there's a book in them. Right. I think that's the common denominator. Everybody to one degree or another believes in themselves so wholeheartedly, so deeply that they would not be denied. So in that single-minded pursuit of their goal, whatever that goal was, you know, in Izzy's case as a kid, it was to be a world champion surfer. He became that, right? Um, In um, Bob Hurley's case, you know, when he was coaching, um, you know, these great championship teams, he was the greatest schoolboy basketball coach in history. Um, He would not be denied. He had no budget. He had 400 kids in his student body. They had no gym. These kids were working out and doing their strength training in a cafeteria, and yet he produced state champion after state champion and eight national championships. You know, these people would not be denied, and I think that's what sets them apart, and that's what makes people want to read books by them. And I think that's been the great takeaway for me is is that I've learned that you can do things your own way um, and leave your own trail. Uh, and that nobody really is in a position to tell you you're going the wrong way. 
first of all, I think you'd be a great politician with an attitude like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think we have a few of those with that attitude right now. <laughs> yeah, I think so as well. It's it's funny you're talking about that because I, I was talking with um, a friend of mine, I think it was like last week, saying how we were, we were talking about what fine of a line there must be between pure genius and, and legends in their craft and complete psychopathic losers, right? Like you take someone like um, we were talking about, I brought up the um, example of like, take someone like Kurt Cobain or like Jim Morrison, like musicians that I greatly admire. Like had they not made it, it's like they would have flopped so hard. They would have been that crazy guy in the corner in the flannel smoking the cigarettes, laying out in the street drunk. But because they made it, because they had that sort of like, F you, I can do whatever I want. I'm bulletproof. It's like there's, isn't there, a, it's like a very fine line. If you like, if you hit it right and get the right luck or the right opportunity, you're like a, a freaking legend and you're going to live on forever as that person. And if you don't get that opportunity, you're that crazy guy passed out in the street with a cigarette or a needle in your arm. Such a fine line. It's a fine line. I mean, but then if you talk to someone like Malcolm Gladwell, who famously puts it out there that, that true greatness and true genius is is only realized when you can put in the 10,000 hours worth of work. The Beatles never would have become the Beatles if right. they didn't log all that time in, in the cavern or in the, you know, all these clubs in Hamburg, Germany. Yep. Um, or Wayne Gretzky never would have become Wayne Gretzky if he wasn't born in the right time of the calendar and, and was able to gain all this other experience ahead of his peers. You, you know, so there are other people who will tell you that there is actually a calculus at play and it's not just fortitude or determination it is it is something else as well um i don't know where i i fall on that i i just know from what i see and the people that i've worked with and at this point there's been a great many of them um and i i think the through line the baseline for each of them is is a belief in themselves which very often was instilled in them uh, by their parents or grandparents. You know, it comes from a place of family. I don't think anybody gets there and builds that strength of character um, or uh, or that sense of, of what they're able to accomplish. I don't think they build that on their own. I think it comes uh, from a recipe that they get at home. I, I can't think of a perfect, uh, a more perfect note to end on than that. That was... Uh... That's great. I mean, that's something, uh, confidence right there, like the ultimate confidence. I don't know if that's something that's, that's taught, something you uh, are born with, uh, maybe it's both, but that, uh, that, that deep commitment of, of knowing that you've achieved some level of mastery mixed in with some really freaking amazing luck is probably a good formula. Right, right. right. And maybe all it is that you're mastering are your circumstances and your environment. It might not be that you're the world's best pole vaulter. It might be that you've kind of figured out the system. Um, and that's mastery of a kind. Dan, are there any projects that we should look for um, in the next year or two? And, and I want everyone also to follow you on, on Twitter. You're uh, at Daniel Paisner and you have DanielPaisner.com as your website. We'll make sure everyone checks you out. But is there anything that um, you want people to, uh, any action items to look for? Uh, any any homework for people? I appreciate your asking. By the nature of what I do, a lot of what I do, I can't really talk about it until okay. it's out there. So I don't want to point all. you into the future. So rather, I, I'd rather take the opportunity to ask your listeners to look back. My last novel is one of my very favorite things. It's called A Single Happened Thing. It's kind of a passive aggressive baseball novel. I don't okay. know if that does it justice. Um, but it was published by Relegation Books, a single happened thing, and it would make me very happy if people stumbled across that. I'm also um, uh, entering your space a little bit. I'm about to start a podcast, oh, cool. which will be available um, probably at the end of the summer on the Writer's Bone Network of um, podcasts and wherever you get your podcast. It's called As Told To, and it's a ghostwriting podcast. Um, so I'd love to return the favor and have you on, except you're not a ghostwriter, so you're shit out of luck. <laughs> but what I do is I, I talk to other folks who do what I do for a living, right. and together uh, we kind of shoot the shit and figure out um, you know, how it is that we do find these through lines in these stories with these rich and celebrated and sometimes under the radar folks. So that's called As Told To, and that, uh, look for that to debut on a monthly basis probably by the end of the summer. Are you going to be talking about like process and... Um technique or is it more uh 
Yeah, it's process. Yeah. There's not a lot of war stories because of yeah. the nature of what we do. Right. If we told tales at a school, we'd never get invited back to school. So um, it's it's more about process. It's more about what we hoped, what we're able to learn from our subjects. It also uh, we talk a lot about um, uh, how we make this type of writing part of a larger writing life. You know, so a lot of the folks I've been talking to do other kinds of work. Some people reach uh, into this type of writing to bridge, uh, to help them over a dry period, uh, you know, when things aren't happening for them creatively, Mm. if there's a dry spell. Um, Some people land on it because it's a good gig and they just need to make some money before they hold up on an island somewhere and write their next project. So what's interesting to me is how people make room for collaborative writing alongside the rest of their writing life. Mm -hmm. So that's been a really rich rewarding experience. We've gotten about five or six uh, episodes in the can right now. And uh, I'm having a lot of fun talking to these folks. I'm talking to them anyway. I'm sure you talk to other artists yep. all the time. So I figured I might as well run a microphone <laughs> while, while we're talking. That's pretty much how this started. I had so many amazing conversations like backstage or at an art gallery or different places in the world. And I'm like, this should be shared. This is even if no one listens, except I'm recording it, I'm documenting it. I can listen to it when I'm 90. Even if that's the only reason it's worth, it's worth doing, but it's, it's, it is cool having that camaraderie because I would imagine you as well, like so much of what I do and I'm sure what you do as well. It's like, it's so isolating. Like here I am in my basement. You know, I, a lot of times during the day, I'll hear my kids pitter patter upstairs while I'm working, but I don't have like co-workers at the water cooler to like schmooze it up with or you know it's it is isolating so to have that camaraderie whether it's virtual or or not it is nice knowing that you're not the only lunatic on the block right there are many lunatics on the block <laughs> and you know what i should I, I correct myself when your book comes out when you're done with your book you know you've had a, you will have had some helping hands in it so that would be of a piece with our subject matter so we'll talk then on on uh, my show yeah i would love to, love to connect you with my developmental editor she is a ghost writer as well although she did not do that for me cuz i couldn't afford those skills so i had to do it the hard way but she was great and just amazing in helping me see what i was doing like putting herself in my shoes asking me the right questions um it was one of the cooler experiences i've had creatively speaking, including art wise, just being able to have someone ask questions that pulled stuff out of me that I didn't see. It was like right in front of me, but I didn't see it until it was presented to me and reframed. It was an amazing oh, experience. So I, I would imagine that your uh, clients feel the same and it's understandable how they can open up to you like, uh, like that. Well, that's great. I'm glad you found somebody that was able to help you along that path. So yes, put us in touch. I'll talk to her. We'll see. Maybe there's a connect there. That's great. Well, thanks, Dan. I'm I'm really grateful. And uh, I really found this like very insightful. And it's again, it's nice to meet another lunatic on the block. So <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy we had this <laughs> chance, man. I hope we can, uh, yeah, surf. Good to connect hope we can here. surf and snowboard at some point. That would be great. Maybe I'll see you on the beach at Belmar or I'll see you on the mountains somewhere. But uh, Sounds good. it was good talking here, Jason, and I've, I've enjoyed this visit. And I, I uh, look forward to hanging one of your pieces in my home. Thanks, guys. We hope you loved that episode. Um, if you did love it and could give us some love on iTunes, that would be amazing. You can leave a review and we will give you a shout out at some point on this podcast also if you guys can follow us on social media we would love to hear from you we are on pretty much every social media platform at shifting perceptions podcast which is the same as our website shifting perceptions podcast.com we look and reply to all comments so please share with your friends tag us we appreciate all the love And don't forget that all of our guests also see all these comments. So I'm sure if you want to just have a space, you can reach out. These are the places to do it. Special thanks to John Harvey for creating and editing and producing our show's music. And thank you to Kevin Rigby for our photo of our podcast. Appreciate you guys all. Talk to you soon.